Good afternoon on this beautiful, hot Father's Day. It is super warm. I don't know if this is how the Philippines feels, but it's how I imagine it feels. Hot and sticky. So all my Filipino friends can tell me after if I'm right or wrong about that. All right. I hope uh, all the dads out there have had a fantastic afternoon fantastic day thus far i had a nice lunch i had a nice nap then i get a phone call telling me i got coffee coming i mean it's been great i will talk to my dad in newfoundland a little bit he's out exploring the countryside so he's doing great so he will say hello to him so that was fantastic as people are jumping on, I uh, want to tell you a story. Us Newfoundlanders love a good story. So on Friday, we were having my father-in-law over for Father's Day. We couldn't work it out today. Just do it on Friday. He was available and he wanted to go to the pond. We went to the pond, watched us do the kayaking and falling in the water on the way home. He wanted KFC, one of his favorite places to eat. I know, I know, it's maybe not yours, but at any rate, we get the KFC, bring it to my house. We get to my house, and we're going to eat it outside. So we get to the house, and it's starting to rain, and it's really bad on the back and the front. My front porch is a little covered. Look great, great. We put out all the food. On a table, it was fantastic, and it started to pour rain, like thunder, lightning. It was quite the light show. It was really fun until the wind changed, and we got soaked. I mean, our chicken was soggy from the water. I mean, it was hilarious. If anyone drove by our house, they're like, what are those crazy people doing? Uh, we had blankets over ourselves trying to cover up and protect uh, Gramps from all the water. It was hilarious, uh, and he assured us he's never had a Father's Day like that, So, and he's not looking for any more like that. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, story done. I hope your Father's Day was not as exciting as that. It was a lot more subdued. All right, um, quiz time. All right, quiz time. Number one, how many dreams did Daniel help King Nebuchadnezzar interpret. How many dreams did Daniel help King Nebuchadnezzar interpret? And I'll slurp on my coffee. <clears throat> How many dreams did Nebuchadnezzar interpret? Or did Daniel help Nebuchadnezzar interpret? See a couple of answers coming in there. Anybody else want to jump on? So it's actually two. Now there's more dreams than that in the entire book of Daniel. But two, the first one was at the very beginning, chapter two. King Kimbenezer couldn't even remember the dream. So Daniel, the Lord revealed what it was, what the dream actually was, and then the interpretation of it. The second dream, Nebuchadnezzar can remember what it was, but didn't know the interpretation. That's in chapter 4, where God uh, foretold of him becoming like an animal, seven years and things. So, Two, uh, that Daniel helped Nebuchadnezzar with. All right, so how tall was the image Nebuchadnezzar demanded that everyone bow to uh, in the plain of Dura? And so Daniel wasn't mentioned in that story, but the three Hebrew men were... How tall was it? How tall was that image? Anybody? 
an answer coming in. Anybody else? Join Boyette. <clears throat> The official uh, measurement that they used in that time was cubits. It was three score cubits, chapter 3, verse 1, which is 90 feet in our measurement. So, Brother Boyette, on the money, 60 cubits high, that's correct. Three scores, 60 cubits. All right, true or false? So, it's 50 50. So, you can wait, uh, no, we don't want to wager a guess, but you can make a guess, all right? Uh, Daniel, true or false, Daniel and his three friends were the only Jewish boys taken to Babylon. Daniel and his three friends were the only Jewish boys taken to Babylon. True or false? All right, so in Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 6, it says, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So it is false. There was more than those four. They're the only four that we know serve God. I mean, I'm not saying that the other, and none other ones did, but those four definitely stood out. All right, uh, and then the final question for this evening how many beasts were in Daniel's dream in chapter 7? How many beasts were mentioned that he see in the dream in chapter 7? We looked at chapter 7 last week. How many beasts? Mm -hmm. All right, seeing a few answers coming in there. So the answer is four. Good work. All those answers, you're correct. Four it is. All right. So uh, we're going to start looking at Daniel chapter 8 now. Uh, Daniel chapter 8 is full. I mean, all of Daniel, I mean, all the books of uh, the Word of God have lots of great information and things. And this, this chapter 8 has lots to unpack. So uh, we're going to break it up rather than try to rush through it because part of the reason why I want to focus a little bit longer on it too is uh, I have seen, witnessed uh, some false teaching that is becoming really rampant. That I, it's, it's disturbing uh, how rampant it has become in churches that you and me would probably attend with the right name on the, on the door and things and they do believe in salvation but they get this part wrong. And it's an important part. I understand you still go to heaven if you don't believe it. I understand that. Uh, but it is, it's important for the end times theology. Uh, so we're going to take a little extra time unpacking all this uh, this week, tonight, and then a Sunday in July, because next Sunday night, if you come online at 5, I will not be here, all right? Uh, between 3 and 5, drive through church there at the at church we, uh, Moulton there. And uh, we'll have some goodies for everybody. Information again coming up, excuse me, on what's coming forward for reopening. And uh, we will continue Sunday nights online for now. We still have to work out all the 
cleaning up and stuff and there's multiple churches meeting in there so we want to get all those things down right so for now we will continue sunday night online not next week though three to five just so everybody knows all right daniel chapter eight and verse number one in the third year of the reign of king belshazzar a vision appeared unto me even unto me daniel after that which appeared unto me at the first and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I was, uh, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and beheld, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, and one was higher than the other, and the higher came up first, up, up last, sorry. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west and the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram and he had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in fury of his power. And I saw him close unto the ram, and it was moved with choler against him. Choler means anger, and smote um, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, Thank you for another time you've given to us. And Lord, I pray you encourage our hearts uh, as we study, examine this chapter 8 of Daniel on important uh, uh, foundational scripture for end time events as well. And Lord, help us to study your word and to dig deep into it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the vision of the ram and the goat, uh, he goat, we, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, we'll look at some more verses as we go along this evening as well. This is really an amplification of Daniel chapter 7, verse 6, explaining how the Greeks will conquer uh, the Medo-Persian, by that time, Persian Empire. And uh, this takes place, this vision takes place uh, two years after Daniel chapter 7. You know, I have read Daniel, the book of Daniel, I couldn't tell you how many times. But I didn't really realize until I read it this time, preparing for this message, that Daniel... You know, he's in a different empire at this time when he says he was, and I was at Shushan. Uh, Shushan is the capital of the Persian Empire. Daniel still, the Babylonian Empire still exists at this time. So the Lord miraculously gave him a vision in the palace of Shushan. And uh, because uh, the Persian Empire, Medo-Persian, would be the next empire. Uh, and the, the Lord was just bringing us all together for Daniel. Uh, sometimes we can read through scripture so quick we understand okay i see sushan yeah okay okay but we kind of forget where it is in context of scripture uh like in the sense of a timeline so uh, i thought that was interesting uh daniel uh three and four talks about the ram you know, that represents the medo persian uh its conquests uh we saw that's mentioned in eight twenty. that that's what it is let me just read you that verse the ram which thou sawest uh, having two horns are the kings of mede and Persia. Uh, just about the time the ram was pushing throw a he, uh, through, the he goat appeared from the west. And that's in Daniel chapter 5. We see that from the west on the face of the whole earth. And uh, this ram, uh, that had two horn. Uh, sorry, this represents uh, the Greek Empire and Alexander the Great. And he's coming now. He attacks the ram and he broke the two, two horns and he becomes very great. Uh, verses 7 and 8. I just read that for you. He becomes notable. He, you know, he's noted. Um, he represents, this represents the conquest of the Greek Empire uh, over the Medo-Persians. We know Alexander dies and the four horns take uh, the place. Uh, represents four generals of his army that divide his kingdom and they rule over it. Uh, but there's mention here a little horn as well. Um, uh, and there was, he go wax very great, and then he was strong, a great horn was broken, and four came up, notable ones, toward the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which whacked exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. 
So we were introduced to this little horn. Now this little horn here is not the Antichrist. Now he represents what Antichrist is about. And we're going to look at more about him next week or next time we look into it. Uh, but he represents that world empire and things. It's not exactly him here, the Antichrist. Uh, he, this one is a connected with the Greek empire. Uh, the little horn was a Greek leader who conquer, conquers the nations to the south and east. That would be Egypt and Persia. And then he invades the pleasant land, which is Palestine. He not only attacks Israel and the surrounding areas, but he attacks the political system. He talks the religious system. He tries to destroy their faith, um, and he try and he establishes uh, sacrifices in the temple. And we'll look at that in the future, uh, the next time we get together. And he sets up the transgressions of the desolations as well. So just to kind of give us a little bit of a groundwork uh, for us, because now we're going to step into verse twenty-three. So I'll look over in verse number twenty-three of this portion of scripture. And in the latter time of their kingdom. So this is not talking about that little little horn, that Greek leader now. Now we're trans it's it's a transition to the future. Okay. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also shall cause craft to prosper in his name. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princesses, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and morning which was told, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up of the vision, and it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted, and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. But I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So it's estimated that since the beginning of time, obviously a biblical worldview. We're not talking about evolution. We don't believe in that. What we're talking about is a biblical worldview. God created the earth uh, six literal days there's, they estimate about 40 billion people have lived on the earth. In that time, there's been some incredibly smart people, talented, uh, intellectual geniuses, uh, powerful people. Uh, however, none of them, none who have ever lived, will be able to match the man who will be known as Antichrist. He will be powerful. He will be energized, not by his own power, as you saw there in verse 24. Uh, he will be extremely deceitful i mean extremely deceitful brutal uh ruthless efficient he all i mean there's a lot, a lot of words we could use to describe him he will represent the pinnacle of man apart from god he in reality he's he's energized we could call him satan's superman he's energized by the, uh, by satan okay now our text tells us that in times, a fierce king will stand up. But what are the signs of his appearing? Now, some of the verses I'm going to mention to you are not in Daniel at all. They're in other parts of the scripture. Uh, but a systematic uh, teaching about in times, you, you have to look through the scripture and see what's there. So what are the signs of his coming? Can man know when he will appear? Well, I think it's two-sided answer, yes and no. Yes and no. I, I'm certain that no one knows who the Antichrist is. God does, but that's it. Uh, we are not told. We are told certain things about the Antichrist, uh, but we don't know who he is. We don't know what his address or anything of that nature. Uh, but there will be things that will take place right at the beginning of his coming, uh, and they're interesting. And I think they're right now. Okay, the condition of the world when this man comes, when he enters the world stage. The world will be in a terrible moral condition. That's evidenced by two portions of Scripture. Um, I'm going to ask you to read them and check them out. I want you, as a listener uh, and watcher right now, uh, to get in God's Word and see. So Luke chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, talks about 
uh, like the days of Noah. It has to be like the days of Noah, okay? I believe we live in those days. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I think some of you have been to the Creation Museum, been to Noah's Ark and things down there in uh, Kentucky. And um, I think it's Kentucky, at any rate. Uh, amazing going in the Ark and things. And they kind of give you a picture of what it might have been like just prior to the flood. The wickedness, the death, uh, the violence that was taking place. And we live, maybe maybe not the same um, circumstances or the same philosophies and things of that time period, but we live in a day of violence and moral decay. Absolutely, we, we live there. All right, so it'll be similar that way. The second portion of Scripture you should look at is 2 Timothy 3, verses 3, or 2 Timothy 3, sorry, verses 1 to 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. It talks about what it'd be like in the days of the pairing, okay? The perilous times shall come. How men act, how they live. There's verses there describing how men will act. We are there. There's no, I look at that verses and I'm like, there's nothing there that is not happening. Maybe not happening in your life, but in our world, definitely. So the condition of the world is there. It's easy to see that our world bears the marks suggesting that the, these things, these conditions are fulfilled. Um, even what we see around us right now. I mean, if this was six months ago and I was preaching Sunday night at church, I would still be, believe the same thing. But now I believe it even greater. It, the evidence are even greater. Just this week, um, I was reading an article just, uh, so I don't know, a friend of mine sent it to me on Facebook or something. Uh, from a doctor in the United States. He's not a Christian, uh, but he's he tries to be very nonpartisan. You know, he's not Democrat, Republican. He's just trying to say this is what we see from science about this COVID thing. And uh, he had all kinds of things to say about vaccine stuff. I wasn't too worried about the vaccine part. What I was really, really struck me is that he said, we need a leader. And he said, we need a leader like a Roosevelt or a Churchill the idea of a great leader to lead us through something like this. And you know, first thing that came to my mind, hmm, Antichrist. I'm not saying that there's not great leaders out there uh, that could help. I'm sure there is. But our world is just right on the cusp of just, just one person. Take care of us all. We are in such a mess. All right. So the condition of our world, and I think the condition of religion uh, is definitely ripe for this as well. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall not come, except there come a falling away. Then, and then that man a son be revealed, the son of perdition. So this tells us that the Antichrist will appear at time of religious apostasy. A falling away. This refers to when organized, visible religion, we're talking about Christianity, departs from the doctrines of the Word of God. The New Testament was written for and about the local church, for believers, about believers. So it, it's not hard to conclude this falling way will fall under the umbrella of Christianity. We're not talking about other religions. We're talking about Christianity. That's what the Word of God's talking about. Now, I hope you understand that just because you see the name Christian written on the sign of a church or a parachurch organization or some sort of ministry do not immediately believe that or, or assume that they are actually christian uh, we live in a day of rapid departure from true biblical christianity from the foundational truths now there was a time maybe not in recent years decades but probably when i was a kid and me and, and a little bit before that if a person came to you and said, I'm a Christian, then there were some things that they believed, and if you were a Christian, that would be similar. One, you believed that Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, you believed the substitutionary death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you believed in the return of Christ, you believed that the Bible is the word of God. Those, those things, say like 40 years ago. Okay, if a Christian, if someone said to you, I'm a Christian, those things would be the same. In other words, a Christian was a person with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ 
and he accepted the Bible teaches uh, and how to live and how to interact with others, well, things have changed since then. Now, the word of God hasn't changed. Man has, okay? You know, today, someone says, I'm a Christian, but they would deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You know, that's a problem. Uh, there, there is definitely individuals I have met who call themselves Christians who cast serious doubt on the accuracy of the word of God. That's a serious problem. Uh, I'm, there, there's people out there, I haven't met them specifically, but I know I've read articles by these individuals who call themselves Christians, and they doubt, they cast much, uh, they even kind of scorn the idea that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Well, that's huge. That's massive. And, and so we're living in that great falling away period. Cults are growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, genuine Christianity finds itself consistently under pressure from society, from government, and from other organized religions, from other ones, just, just not within us as well. So when... What hinders, so what's hindering the Antichrist from jumping in on the scene right now? What, and what keeps the tribulation from starting? There, there is an event that has to take place before the tribulation period uh, commences. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. And now ye knoweth what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So the event that needs to take place is the rapture of the church, okay? The rapture of the church, the completion of the church needs to take place. Uh, this verse, these verses, there's two verses here, uh, teach us that when the church is removed, the Antichrist will be revealed. Uh, verses 6 and 7, verse 6, talks this word withholdeth. And verse 7 talks about one who letteth. Those two words translated out of the original language mean to hinder. The Bible tells us that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. That's why we can see the evidence around us, right? We know he's at work. There's, there's the two things that are holding him back, the event of the rapture. So that's these things make up that event. That is the church and the Holy Spirit. Okay, the church raptured out. And the Holy Spirit is at work right now convicting and judging the hearts of men. He, he is a tremendous restraining force in the world. You need to look up John chapter 16, verses 8 and 11. That's what those verses teach us. That's what the Holy Spirit is at work. I mean, besides working in our hearts as individual believers, he's at work convicting and judging those in this world and, re, and restraining so the, the Spirit's working in the church, individual believers, helping them fulfill the commission that God gave us, stands against the tide of evil. So when that rapture takes place, the church is gone, and then the Holy Spirit, that restraining force, re is removed as well. It's, it's gone. And then it's worth noting, at that point, so the rapture takes place, then the tribulation begins. A and... The tribulation is not for the church. It's called Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jacob had nothing to do with the church. I mean, he was long gone before the church occurred, before God established the church. Uh, we're told in Daniel chapter 9, I'm going to read this verse for you in a moment, we're told in Daniel the tribulation was a time for Israel. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Okay, so just pause there for a second. The church never sacrifices or does oblations. We, we don't sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. He has died. He has shed his blood. We don't do any. It's covered under his blood now. The Judeo uh, system, Judaism, they looking to restore that sacrifice system because for them the Messiah has not come. He has, but they don't believe it yet. All right, and so for the and then continue that verse. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that 
the determined shall be poured out upon the desolation. The tribulation period is also known as ta, uh, as a time of God's wrath. You, you can see that in Revelation 6, verse 16 to 17, and Revelation 16, 1. Okay? It talks about that, God's wrath. The Bible clearly teaches that God's children have been saved from wrath through Jesus. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being more justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Now, I've met some people say, well, that's referring to hell. Well, there's, there's truth to that. We are saved from hell. But why would God save us from hell, that wrath, and allow us to go into the wrath that he's designed to judge this world? Makes, there's, there's no biblical connection points. Okay, uh, One of the greatest proofs the church will not uh, see the tribulation is Christ's promise to the church of Philadelphia. We looked at um, those six churches uh, a while ago on Sunday morning. Let me read you the verse in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to them that dwelleth upon the earth. Now, we, when we looked at them, churches, those, those uh, churches in Revelation, we saw that obviously it was a specific church, but that message was for every church. It wasn't just for that specific church that they'd get this special little blessing. No, it's entire Christianity for all local churches, okay? Churches around the world. So he's saying, hey, you're, you're not going to go through that. It, to, it's the idea that tribulation is to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's the earth dwellers. There are those who rebel. They, they rebel against God. They want to live their way. They will not listen to what God says. Okay. And uh, there, there is a, a growing um, influence uh, of teachers and ministries that are propagating uh, that we, the church will go through the first three and a half years of tribulation. Uh, they, they have some major problems with that. And, and the problem is Israel. Okay, I believe with all my heart, you're never going to change my mind that God is going to deal with Israel. God loves Israel. He's not done with her yet. And the tribulation time is when they turn back to God because the church is out of here. Okay, so they, they take some of these applications and, and say, well, the, the Lord's prophecy to Israel is to be applied to the church or that the church is Israel. Both are wrong conclusions. You can't do that. Okay. Uh, from Scripture, that I, and I, I mean, I've studied this out. This isn't uh, a quick uh, flyby, oh, I put these together five minutes ago or anything. Uh, from what I can see from Scripture, the church leaves this world at the beginning of the trip, uh, right at the beginning, actually, the rapture takes place, then the tribulation, because the tribulation is time when God deals with Israel, he brings her back to himself, and he deals with the wicked and Satan and the Antichrist, which we've been looking at already. All right, so <sighs> we got part of it through, okay? So we'll continue next time on more about um, the future, and we're going to look at the past uh, because there was a Greek general who did some really wicked things in Jerusalem, and we're going to look at him a little bit as well the next time we get together and uh, look in God's Word. So just some reminders for you. Uh, Wednesday at 7, Pastor Matt will continue in his Bible study series. Uh, you can get the notes via church email or go to our website. They'll be there so you can follow along, take notes and things. Uh, Thursday, uh, we'll be having a missionary update. And then after this one on Thursday, we won't have any till a little bit later in July. Uh, just getting you know people's schedules and, and getting people to send them in and stuff to missionaries. And some of our missionaries deal with the lack of uh, internet. Uh, we, we kind of forget how good we got it here. Uh, they they don't have access. They might have recording capabilities, uh, but just the, the Wi-Fi to upload and things of that nature. Uh, so we'll be looking to that to a little bit more later in July. Uh, so we'll still have more. And I don't know about you, but I've been really encouraged watching those videos and getting a little bit more understanding what our missionaries are going through. It's great. I wish we would have done it years ago. It would have helped us so much more. But at any rate, uh, we'll look forward to that on Thursday. And then Saturday at 8.30, uh, devotional time. So we'll look forward to that. 
And then next Sunday night, this afternoon, I should say, 3 to 5, come on by through the church, drive through, uh, and by that time, we'll have a lot more um, answers for you about what things, how things are going to look going to church back on the 5th of July. Uh, just be patient with us. We're just trying to put together the best way we can. And then a little bit of an added, uh, it's not stress, but the added work is that we got to remember other churches are coming behind us and things. So we're going to work together, make it to be the very best that's possible for every church that's meeting in the building. So uh, lots of work. Keep praying for one another. Keep praying for us, the church staff. Uh, praise the Lord for all that's taking place. Uh, and it's encouraging to hear from folks uh, as the Lord has moved in your hearts, uh, good things are happening. Maybe you're getting opportunities to witness a little bit better or whatever the case. Always encouraging to hear. I always love to hear those blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon you. That's an encouragement. You can text me that anytime. All right. Uh, don't text me the bad stuff. Text Pastor Matt the bad stuff. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, at any rate, uh, so thankful for our church family and uh, keep, keep serving the Lord. Uh, keep digging in, exploring the word. And folks, have a great week. God bless.